We're so glad to have you with us this week at Calvary PSL. Whether you're watching online or here in person, welcome to church. For all of March, we will be having free Kona ice, bounce houses, music, and popcorn after our Saturday night gatherings. The worship, teaching, and kids ministry is exactly the same as Sundays, except it's a party in the courtyard. We can't wait to see you there. Discover Calvary is your first step to connecting here at Calvary PSL. Through this two-part series, you'll discover how God is calling you to connect, grow, and invest in your church. Discover Calvary will take place Sundays, March 20th and 27th at CCA. Please register online at calvarypsl.com slash next steps. We are so thankful to be a part of a community that gives so generously. Here at Calvary PSL, our mission is to make lifelong followers of Christ. We're able to accomplish this calling through your selfless giving. Thank you to those who give regularly and to those who give above and beyond. To give, go to calvarypsl.com and click on Give or download the Push Pay app from your app store. Worship is about to begin, so grab your coffee and find a seat. We can't wait to worship with you. Good morning, Calvary PSL. All right. My name is Marielle. I'm one of the ministry partners here, and it is my joy to welcome you to our 11 a.m. gathering. Now, let's see, who was here for first Thursday this past Thursday? Yes, see all the hands. So can we thank God for the honor and privilege of getting to baptize 11, uh, 10 individuals taking their next step of faith? So fun. If you missed last uh, month's first Thursday or this month's first Thursday, you can come to next month's first Thursday. We'd love to have you. Now let's continue to thank the Lord for all He is doing here in our church family through our praise and worship. We're so happy you're here this morning, Calvary. We're really excited to worship with you this morning. God is so worthy of our praise and all the highest honor. Would you give that to Him this morning? Sing the weapon may be formed. The goddess of knows only how to triumph And my God will never fail, no My God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see 
we're so thankful for who you are today. You have been so faithful. We can put all of our trust in you, Lord, because the evidence of your goodness and of your faithfulness is marked all over our lives time and time again, Lord. That when I have been faithless, you have been faithful, God. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Thank you that we have the victory in you and only you, Lord, that we can put our hope, our trust, our faith, our lives, our family in your hands and know that it's gonna be taken care of. How sweet it is to praise you this morning, Jesus. feet and to look up and give you the highest praise today to let go of fear and anxiety and to look up and give you the highest praise that you're worthy God. church we're going to teach you a new song today it's called i belong to jesus i feel like you can tell it's going to be really powerful if it's called i belong to jesus you know, there's a lot of fear in the world right now, and maybe there always has been, but it feels like right now, with everything going on, um, there's a lot of tension and a lot of fear. And so it's extra important that as believers, we remind ourselves who we belong to, who He is, the King of kings and Lord of lords and Prince of peace. We're His children. We belong to Him. And so fear will never conquer us because we know who we belong to, amen? Anxiety will never conquer us. Shame will never conquer us because we belong to Jesus today. Maybe you're here um, today or you're watching online and, and you don't know Jesus that way. I just wanna encourage you that he really is the Prince of Peace. He really is true peace and joy and hope and he will change your life if you let him. If you place your faith in Jesus, he will come and give you real peace no matter the circumstances. That's who he is. Come on, would you pray with me, church? God, we, we thank you that you're filling us even right now with your peace. God, we bring our fear and our anxiety and the pressures of life and we lay them at your feet. We hand them over to you and we replace that fear with worship this morning. We replace that fear with our praise and our song lifted high to the King of Kings in the name above every other name. We worship you today in spirit and in truth.
Your presence is enough when I feel the shaking. Oh, I will stay in my ground. Cause your presence is enough. Seeing you are with me. And Father, you're for me. And fear will never conquer me. Cause I belong to Jesus. I'm never alone I'm never abandoned Oh, fear you'll never conquer me Cause I belong to Jesus When I feel the pressure You're surrounding me, you're in every 
Cause I belong to Jesus Fear you'll never conquer me Cause I belong to Jesus yeah. Fear you'll never conquer me Cause I Yeah, speak to that giant in front of you today Say you fear you'll never conquer me Cause I belong to Jesus Come on Yeah, fear you'll never conquer me
Jesus' face. Let's sing that one more time together. of your grace we get what we don't deserve thank you for your eternal hope thank you for your infinite love Holy Spirit we ask that as you continue to minister to the hearts that are listening to me right now God, I pray that you continue to illuminate the word as we transition to the next portion time together in your message. We love you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. Good afternoon. Let me try that again. Good afternoon. Hey, so glad you guys came to 11 a.m. service here at Calvary PSL. Um, really uh, blessed to have you with us today. And so I want to ask you guys to please grab your Bibles and turn to John chapter 3. The title of the message today is Born of the Spirit. Born of the Spirit, John chapter 3. And as you're turning in your Bibles or pulling up the Bible on your smartphone or mobile device, I um, just want to say that in these uncertain times, it's so important, church family, that we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. Amen. So don't lose your focus during difficult times. How many of you guys understand that the kingdom of Christ is coming and it cannot be shaken? Amen. Cannot be shaken. I tell you guys, I think every week, I've read the last chapter. In the end, we win because Christ wins and we belong to Christ. And so um, nothing's going to ever change that. And so we keep our eyes on the certainty of Christ, the certainty of his coming kingdom. In the meantime, while we're waiting for him to come back, we occupy till he comes. That means that uh, the number one thing we should be doing is praying. As I said last week, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. But not, don't just stop with praying. Also be giving asking the Holy Spirit to lead you as far as how you can help. And, and so we know, we are all watching the news, we know there's a lot of people, over a million, who are displaced, who are refugees, and they need help. And so, you know, just ask the Lord, between you and him, what the Lord would have you uh, to do. Uh, I'll do the same thing and have been. What, what does God want me uh, to do? I think it's so important that we always uh, stand up for the hurting. And so we're gonna <clears throat> pray, we're gonna give, uh, we're going to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, and we're going to know that God is sovereign. And so we're going to pray. 
Um, I'm gonna ask you guys to bow your heads and hearts. I'll pray out loud while you have your own time uh, here with the Lord. And so, Father, um, it is crazy to see what is going on in our world right now, but nothing takes you by surprise. And Father, we know that the prince of the power of the air has a heyday in this fallen world. And we know, Lord, from Ephesians chapter two, um, that he has um, power over unregenerate, unsaved uh, people. And Lord, the hope is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we're asking, Lord, that the thousands and thousands of Christians in the Ukraine, in Eastern Europe, Lord, other countries in that area, Lord, that the gospel would go forth in power and that your people would shine as lights during this dark and dismal time. We're asking that, Lord, thousands and thousands and thousands of people would turn to Jesus Christ and repentance and faith and find the forgiveness and the hope and the love that only you can provide. And Lord, we're just grateful uh, that you're a very present help in time of need. Lord, our hearts are heavy for the children, and so we're asking again that you would put your angels all around these little kids, that you would protect them, uh, keep them from harm's way, protect them physically from physical injury, but also, God, protect them uh, mentally and emotionally from mental and emotional trauma. And God, we're just, we're just asking that you would stop the violence, stop the bloodshed. We're asking, Father, for uh, for just your strong intervention. In the meantime, help us to keep our eyes on you and help us, Lord, to continue to pray and help us to continue to see how we can be a practical help to people who are in need. I pray that around the world, the church would be the church and that you would be glorified. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said. Amen. All right, so today, as I said, the title of the message is Born of the Spirit, and we are in John chapter two. And so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk about the topic of being born again. And that's a term that many Americans, of course, have heard of, even if they don't understand what it means. And so in our culture, the expression born again, it's usually used to describe someone or something um, that is not doing well, but then that person or that thing, you know, experiences a new beginning, so to speak, and becomes stronger and successful. For example, let's say there's a football team, and the football team, year after year, season after season, continues to lose and lose and lose, but then suddenly, they have a winning season and they win the Super Bowl. So many people in the media, so many other people will say, that team has been born again. Or a company, you know, a company that is usually operating in the red, but then all of a sudden they have this financial turnaround and now all of a sudden uh, they're in the black, they're getting out of debt. People will say, that company has been born again. Or a person, right, is experiencing a, a difficult situation in their life and it's got them down, but then all of a sudden they, they find a solution to their problem and they feel better. And what do we often hear? Man, I feel like I've been born again. And so that's the general way our culture uh, has used the term, but you need to know they got it wrong. <laughs> Not realizing where the term born again comes from or what it means. As we dive into John chapter three today, I can stand before you with certainty and let you know that the term born again originated with Jesus Christ. And it means something very different than what many people think. So it's true, when your favorite team wins the championship, you feel happy. When the company you've invested in makes a turnaround and it gets stronger and your stocks are increasing, you're happy. Or you find a solution to your problem, you're happy. But ladies and gentlemen, hear me now. None of those things even scratch the surface of the spiritual joy and inner fulfillment that comes when someone is truly born again. And so, man, what an important section of the Bible we're tackling today in John chapter three. We're gonna discover today that the term born again means, title of the message, born of the spirit. And it refers to the most important 
event that could ever happen to anyone. And the most important question that I want you guys to be asking yourself throughout the message, those of you in the room, those of you watching online, is simply this, have you been born again? Have you truly been born of the Spirit? And so right now, if you're looking at John chapter three, verse one, can you say amen so I know you're there? And by the way, isn't it exciting? We're making progress through John. We're already on the third chapter. And so verse one, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. All right, so let's stop right there. Here we're introduced to someone new in John's gospel, a man named Nicodemus, who we're gonna see again in chapter seven when we get there in about a year. And then we're gonna see him again in chapter 19, which is probably 10 years from now, I'm just kidding. Uh, but he does appear a couple times again in the Gospel of John. Now John tells us two things about this man. First of all, that he was a Pharisee, and second of all, that he was a, quote, ruler of the Jews. That means that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. All right, so what was the Sanhedrin? You need to know this so you understand the New Testament and the Gospels as you're uh, studying on your own time. And so the Sanhedrin was a council of 71 men, including the high priest, made up of, note this, Sadducees and Pharisees who ruled over the Jewish nation and exercised jurisdiction over religious, civil, and criminal matters. All right, so this was the high court of Israel. This was the high council of Israel. This was, was the elite of the, the elites, the, the men who ruled over the Jewish people. Notice the Sanhedrin was made up of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. All right, and so who were the Sadducees? Well, the, the Sadducees were part of the aristocracy of Israel. They were rich, uh, which I'm sure made them happy. But here's the problem. The Sadducees, they denied everything supernatural. That means that they denied the spirit realm. They denied angels. They denied the resurrection. They denied the afterlife. And that's why they were sad, you see? <laughs> All right, so I throw that in and see if you're awake. You got the Sadducees, part of the 71 member Sanhedrin, and you got the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they represented the common man and they accepted supernatural things. How many of you guys know that the su supernatural realm absolutely exists? 100%. Okay, so the Pharisees were right on that. Here's the problem. These were the legalists of the day. That means that they added man-made rules to God's word and then they imposed those man-made legalistic rules on other people and that's just not fair, you see. Uh, three people laughed that time, all right. So two groups, Sadducees, Pharisees, within the Sanhedrin and normally they're at odds with one another but what you need to know is that in the gospel, these two groups came together in order to criticize and condemn the Lord Jesus Christ. They're always fighting, 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 but when it comes to Jesus, hey, we're gonna join forces so that we can come against Jesus of Nazareth. Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, but you need to know this about Nicodemus. And by the way, I like this guy, because Nicodemus has a different attitude toward Jesus than his colleagues. Nicodemus actually has a positive attitude toward the Lord. And so there was a man, verse one, of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Verse two, this man came to Jesus by, what's the word? Night. And said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs, these miraculous signs that you do, unless God is with him. All right, so why did G uh, Nicodemus come to Jesus at night? Lots of theories out there. I think, personally, he didn't want his colleagues to know. And so he, under the cover of darkness, goes to see um, Jesus. And even though the 
Sanhedrin, as I just said, was very critical and eventually would condemn the Lord. You need to know that Nicodemus was drawn to the Lord. Why? Because of the miracles, the signs that Jesus had been performing. And even though his peers are gonna later say, you know, he casts out demons by the prince of demons. You know, he, he uh, does these miracles in the power of Beelzebub. Even though Nicodemus' peers are gonna say that later in the Gospels, you need to know that Nicodemus and a few others at this point had a different attitude. They knew that Jesus' miracles were from God. Now you also need to know that it's the first century AD in our Bibles and the Jews are under Roman oppression, under the thumb of Rome, and they are longing for the coming of their Messiah. And the Jews know when the Messiah comes, he's gonna bring in the kingdom. All right, so what is the kingdom of God? We have to define that because that's one of the themes of our text today. What is the kingdom of God? Well, you need to know that it's talking about, in the Bible, when it talks about the kingdom of God, the future kingdom of the son of David, the who? The Messiah. And so what did Isaiah, by the way, eighth century BC, so 700 years before Christ, what did he prophesy about the future king and his kingdom? Well, Merry Christmas, here it is, right? You guys recommend this on your Christmas cards? I bet you didn't know, 700 BC is when this was written, or thereabouts. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. That's exciting to me, especially in these uncertain times when governments are kind of going crazy right now. Here's what you need to know, that one day Christ is gonna come back to the earth, literally, and ladies and gentlemen, the international government is gonna be on the shoulders of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's exciting, yeah, we should clap. All of us should be right now, I'm gonna join you. Clap and look forward to the day when the government is gonna be on his shoulder. There is not gonna be any peace internationally until the Prince of Peace comes. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness, from this time forth and forevermore, and for all the doubters and all the skeptics and all the people who think I'm crazy for talking about the second coming of Jesus, oh, it'll never happen. You need to know it's gonna happen whether you like it or not because of that last sentence, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And I said so often, if Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies of his first coming literally, why in the world do we doubt that he's gonna not fulfill all the prophecies concerning his second coming. He will fulfill those prophecies. We should look forward to that day. And so Nicodemus knew these verses. Nicodemus was a scholar of the scholars. He was the teacher of Israel. So he knew these verses. He's looking forward to the coming king. He's looking forward to the coming kingdom. And so what does Jesus do in our text? Jesus goes, uh, gets straight to the point. He can see right in Nicodemus' heart because he, as we've learned, is omniscient, being fully God and fully man. And so he gets right to the point. What's the point? How to enter the kingdom of God. Okay, so let's look at it now. What does Jesus say in verse three? Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is, please shout out the next two words. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Does anybody here think that what we're talking about today is important? <laughs> yeah. Really important. Truly, truly, I mean, Jesus is emphasizing this. I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, by the word, the, the Greek word again can also be um, translated from above. And so many Jews at that time, 
wrongly assumed that because they were the descendants of Abraham and were circumcised, that they would enter the kingdom. Jesus' response in verse three absolutely rocked Nicodemus' world. Jesus' response removed that wrong assumption. Um, regarding this, D.A. Carson wrote this. He said, predominant religious thought in Jesus' day affirmed that all Jews would be admitted to that kingdom apart from those guilty of deliberate apostasy or extraordinary wickedness, example, Mishnah Sanhedrin 10.1. Here's the thing, but here was Jesus telling Nicodemus, a respected and conscientious member, not only of Israel, but of the Sanhedrin, that he cannot enter the kingdom unless he's born again. And so what you gotta understand is that Nicodemus is shocked, Nicodemus is stunned, Nicodemus right now is picking up his jaw from the table, so to speak. And so I don't even know if he knows what to say, but look at what he kind of blurts out in verse four. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And so obviously Nicodemus is having a hard time understanding what in the world Jesus is talking about. And you need to know when we're having a hard time understanding what Jesus is talking about, Jesus wants us to understand what he's talking about. And I wanna encourage you again, when we come to church, we don't check our minds at the door. We do open our Bibles, we do study the Bible, and we do understand that the Lord does, by his spirit, wanna illuminate us and help us to understand what he's saying to us. And so because Nicodemus isn't getting it, Jesus continues to teach. Look at verse five. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Jesus is talking about two births in verse six, natural birth, and spiritual birth. And as I've told you guys before, I am so grateful that in November of 1966, that which was born of flesh is flesh and I entered into this world. Thank God for my mom, right? I'm here. And so physical birth. But you know what I'm more excited about? I'm more excited about that in May of 1984, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. I was born again by the Spirit of God. And so, what does that mean? That I have assurance, not because I'm so good, because I'm not, but I have assurance because of the promise of God that I will one day enter the kingdom of God. The question is, do you have that assurance yourself? And so, let's think about this. Let's dig deeper into the scriptures. Jesus is saying in verses uh, five and six, Nicodemus, if anyone wants to enter the kingdom of God, they must be born of water and of the spirit. All right, so what in the world did Jesus mean by water? Now some say this refers to water baptism, making water baptism necessary for salvation. I disagree. That cannot be correct. Why? Because the New Testament is very clear that we're justified we're declared righteous by God, we're justified by faith in Christ alone. And if you're wondering where in the world do you get that, Pastor, I get it from all over the New Testament, but let me just read you one um, passage that backs up what I just said. Romans 5, 1, therefore since we have been justified, declared righteous by God, by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, one of my favorite stories in the book of Acts is when the Philippian jailer was saved. And you remember the story in Acts chapter 16, there's this great earthquake, right? And the Philippian jailer thinks all of the prisoners in the prison have run away, they're gone, he's about to kill himself. And all of a sudden, Paul's like, don't do yourself any harm, we're still in here. 
And then he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? You guys remember this? And how does Paul respond? Well, Paul responds in verse 31 of chapter 16 of Acts, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. He didn't say believe and be baptized and you'll be saved. He says believe, but guess what happened? After the guy gets saved, Paul goes down to his house, preaches the gospel to his family, the family gets saved, and then what does Paul do? He baptizes them. And so here's my point. Baptism does not save us. Christ saves us when we turn to him in genuine repentance and faith. But you gotta understand this. Baptism is so important. And sometimes it makes me kind of uncomfortable when I'm reading the New Testament and I see how important baptism is to the authors of the New Testament. And then I look and see how unimportant it seems to be in our church world today. Baptism is important. Baptism is the first step of obedience after we're saved. Baptism is a commandment of Jesus Christ. And so what did Jesus say before he went to the right hand of the Father? He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe whatever I've commanded you or all I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That's a commandment from the Lord. And so help me out, church family. If you have not been baptized, what's the word? Since. Since. (laughs) Infant baptism isn't in the Bible. It's not in the scriptures. It's not in the New Testament. So if you have not been baptized since you've turned to Christ in repentance and faith, you gotta do that. It follows salvation, it's the first step of obedience. You go to our website, um, you click on next steps, scroll down to baptism and sign up for the next first Thursday and by faith, oh man, we'll, we'll have fun. We'll dunk you in the water in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Just like we dunked 10 people this past Thursday So awesome to see that and rejoice and clap and just celebrate. So, it's not baptism. So let's go back to verse five and find out what in the world Jesus meant. And so John chapter three, verse five, Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of, okay, so that's a preposition that links the two words, water and spirit. So what are we doing now? We're going even deeper into our study. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so what did Jesus mean by the term water? If you're listening now, say amen here. So again, D.A. Carson, who knows Greek a lot better than me, he says, quote, the preposition of governs both water and spirit, end of quote. What does that mean? That means that the preposition of in verse five links water and spirit together to uh, refer to the one spiritual birth. All right, so here's the bottom line. The bottom line is that being born of water and the spirit refers to the cleansing from sin and spiritual transformation that the Holy Spirit brings about in a person when they get saved. That's what it means. I'll say it again, bottom line. Being born of water and the spirit, it refers to the cleansing from sin and spiritual transformation that the Holy Spirit brings about in a person when they get saved. All right, so regarding this, John MacArthur wrote this, quote, Jesus made reference to the spiritual washing or purification of the soul accomplished by who? You guys tell me. The Holy Spirit. Through the word of God at the moment of salvation required for belonging to his kingdom. That is a biblically sound interpretation which is held by many solid evangelical scholars. Now, you need to know that John chapter three isn't the only place in the New Testament that talks about being born again. There's other places in the New Testament. Um, I'll give you one example. Paul wrote about the new birth in his letter to Titus. 
So Titus is a pastor. Paul writes a letter to him in, in, in your New Testament, and it says this. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. Here it is. By the washing of, please shout out the word, regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out to us or on us ritually through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now I hope you didn't miss it, and I wanna emphasize it again. Salvation does not come to us because of our good works. Do you guys see that? And the reason I'm emphasizing this right now is because if you go out on the street and you, and you ask the average person, um, do you think you're gonna go to heaven? If they even believe in heaven, this is what they're probably gonna say, yes. And you say, why? And they usually say, because I'm a good person. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the question, is anybody reading the New Testament anymore? <laughs> because it's super clear throughout the Bible and in this passage specifically that when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness. It's not by our good works. He goes on to say, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration. And so the term regeneration is a synonym of the expression born again, the term born again. And it refers to the act of the Holy Spirit when he imparts spiritual life to sinners when they turn to Christ in repentance and faith. I found a great quote from Dr. Norman Geisler this morning and um, sent it to Brian and, and we included it in the slides today. I love this regarding regeneration. He says, the source of regeneration is God. The result of regeneration is sonship or daughtership. The means of regeneration is the Holy Spirit. And the duration of regeneration is for how long? Is it just me or does that make anybody happy? <laughs> it's forever. It's forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. We have our minds focused on this little life. 70, 80, 90 years, whatever God blesses us with, if that. And we're so focused on this life and we gotta understand, we gotta get our eyes um, focused on eternity and the promises of God. And so when a person turns to Christ in repentance and faith, here's what the Holy Spirit does. He comes in and he gives the person eternal life. They become a member of God's family. You guys remember John 1, 12? He says, but to all who did receive Christ, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. When I was born physically in November of 1966, and by the way, some of you guys are still doing the math, I'm 55. All right, so <laughs> when I was, and I feel it today for some reason, I just do, pray for me. All right, so when I was born physically um, in November of 1966, I was born into the family of Carl and Mary Wiggins. Praise the Lord. But when I was born spiritually by the Holy Spirit in May of 1984, I was born into the family of God. That's what the Bible says here. But to all who did receive Christ, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. Now here's another thing that makes me excited, that along with this new spiritual life that the Holy Spirit gives us, comes a new capacity to please our Heavenly Father. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And by God's grace, if you're listening, say amen here. Amen. The fruit of regeneration is life transformation. Isn't that what Paul said? 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Ladies and gentlemen, there should be evidence, which I'll talk about in a moment, but there should be evidence that we have been born again. 
Look at verse seven now. Do not marvel, Jesus says to Nicodemus. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born, he keeps emphasizing this, you must be born again. Verse eight, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, I I personally think that at this point in the conversation, the wind starts blowing in through the window. Or maybe if they're meeting up on a rooftop, which was common in those days, the wind just starts to blow. And what does Jesus do? Because he's a master illustrator. He uses the wind that's blowing as an illustration of what he's talking about. Did you guys know that in the Greek language, the word for spirit and the word for wind is the same Greek word. Pneuma. Pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A. Okay, so with that in mind, look again at verse eight. The wind, the pneuma, blows where it wishes and you hear its sound but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit, the pneuma, same Word. And so what is he doing? He's using wind to illustrate the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So just like no one can control the wind or know where it comes from or where it goes, so no one can control the Holy Spirit or fully understand how in the world the Holy Spirit moves. But how many of you are glad that he moves? That he works? I love the fact that the Holy Spirit is here right now. I love the fact that I sensed his presence during worship with hundreds of others of you. I love the fact that when Jesus went up, the Spirit of God came down. The comforter is here, the helper is here, the paraclete is here. But here's the thing, going back to the wind, even though the wind itself can't be seen, can't see the wind, you can see its effects. What happens when the wind blows? You see clouds that are moving, that's an effect. You see branches of trees swaying, that's an effect. You you hear leaves rustling, right? That's an effect. And so likewise, even though we can't see the Holy Spirit, we can see his effects in the life of a born again believer. You see, after we're justified by faith in Christ, the Spirit begins the work of sanctification. So he begins to sanctify us. And the result, the fruit of sanctification is that our thoughts and our words and our actions begin to change. So we're justified by faith, we're saved, right? And then the Holy Spirit starts this lifelong process of of sanctification, conforming us into the image of Christ, changing us. And so think about this for a moment, if the branches of your life, so to speak, aren't swaying? In other words, if your life isn't changing, you should ask yourself, have I really been born again? And this has been on my heart, and I just, you guys know, because you're you're hearing me uh, keep emphasizing this. But here's what I know. In a church this size, not everybody has a relationship with Jesus. And so as I said last week, The Bible says examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. And don't misunderstand, salvation, I'll be preaching this until the day I take my last breath, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from meritorious works. But here's what you need to know, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, the old is passed away, behold the new has come. There should be evidence of our salvation. Is this making sense to you guys? If so, can you say amen so I know you're with me? All right, so look at verse nine now. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? He's just blown away. And Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you don't understand these things? Nicodemus, you've been studying the scriptures for years. You're the teacher of Israel, the scholar of scholars, the teacher of teachers. And apparently what happened was Nicodemus uh, forgot a couple or a few passages from the Old Testament, especially God's word through Ezekiel. So look at this now. This is Old Testament. 
God says, quote, I will sprinkle clean, what's the word there? So that's a metaphor for spiritual cleansing from sin. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. I love this. In fact, when um, my oldest daughter, Megan, got saved, my wife and I took this verse and we put it in a frame and put it on her, her wall. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Now yes, that promise describes God saving Israel in the future, but listen, it also applies to any individual Jew and, praise the Lord for this, any individual Gentile who turns to Christ in repentance and faith. It's the new covenant. And that promise, the promise of the new covenant, it includes a spiritual cleansing from sin. It includes a new heart. It includes the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit of God. And it's given in the same Old Testament, the same Hebrew scriptures that Nicodemus possessed and that Nicodemus studied. Nicodemus, you're the teacher of Israel. <laughs> you don't know what I'm talking about? All right, look at verse 11. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we've seen, but you don't receive our testimony. And I remember, I wonder how many people in churches are sitting in church, churches like ours, listening to a pastor like me, and they're just not receiving it. Verse 12, if I have told you earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And this next one's a really big bomb. He says, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the, what's his name? Son of man. Ladies and gentlemen, that is an Old Testament title for the Messiah. And so what is Jesus basically saying to Nicodemus? He's saying, Nicodemus, I can speak with certainty about heavenly matters because I'm from there. I'm from heaven. I am the son of man. I am the Messiah. He's telling them right here. I'm the Messiah who came down from heaven. And I would love to just go back in time and get in the corner of that room or the corner of that, that rooftop and look at Nicodemus' face right now because not only is his jaw dropped open, his eyes are like this right now. What a privilege, what an honor for Jesus to be saying these things to Nicodemus. Verse 14, Jesus said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man, Messiah, be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So what's Jesus doing right here? Jesus is having a Bible study right here. Welcome to our Bible study. Jesus is going back to Numbers chapter 21, verses four through nine. He's reminding Nicodemus of this story. What story? Well, if you remember, after God rescued the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of their bondage through the Red Sea, all, led them all the way up to Kadesh Barnea, he wants them to go into the land, take the promised land, right? But what do they do? They give in to their fear. They give in to unbelief. They refuse. There's giants in the land. We can't go in there. They got their eyes on the giants and got their eyes off the Lord. So what was the response of God? Pretty much, Baruch King, have it your own way. Right, that's in the original Hebrew. And the next thing you know, what are they doing? They're wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years. Ladies and gentlemen, please hear me. Don't, you sang it a little while ago. I love that new song. Don't give in to fear. Keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and walk in faith. I don't want anyone to have to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years. And so that's what happened. They're wandering around. Now, at some point toward the end of their wilderness wanderings, they begin to gripe and, claim and, 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 and uh, complain and moan and groan. 
You've brought us out of Egypt. Why, Moses? To die in this wilderness? We're thirsty, there's no water. We're hungry and all we have is this manna. It's worthless. And so what's happening? They're ungrateful for God's blessings. Don't be ungrateful for God's blessings. Just count your blessings, name them one by one. I love, you know, when my mind's going negative to stop it, right? I'm not gonna give in to the flesh and I begin to just count my blessings and thank you, God, and thank you, God, and thank you, God, and thank you, God, naming all the blessings that God, that's, that's what we need to have. We need to have an attitude of gratitude. But these people, the children of Israel, were ungrateful for God's blessing and because of their sin, he sent judgment. Do you guys remember what he sent? Fiery serpents, snakes, right? Ah, right, in the, in, the, in the camp of Israel. And what are these fiery serpents doing? They're biting the children of Israel and they call them fiery serpents because every time they bit you, it was like your leg was on fire and the Bible says many died. This is serious stuff and that got their attention. And good news, they repented. We've sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against you, Moses. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents. And so Moses prayed. And look at the Lord's response here. God says, stay with me here. This is so important. God says, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. Now stop right there. It's like, are you kidding me? (laughs) What do you want me to do? Make a fiery serpent. So can can you see? The fire, can you see the hammer? Can you see the bronze um, image that's coming together, this this, this serpent, this snake? Moses is doing what God told him to do. He he makes this, this snake, right, and he puts it on a pole. And, And maybe, I'm just guessing, but maybe this pole, right, had a horizontal cross beam to hold the snake. Can you guys see it? And this is what God says. He says, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole and look at the promise here. Everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. Now that right there is a promise of God. And what should our response be whenever God gives us a promise? Our response should be faith. We should believe God. We should believe his promises. And so God says, you look at it, you're gonna live. And so Moses made a bronze serpent and he set it on a pole. And if the serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and what's that last word? Live. And so follow the thinking here. The repentant people who had been bitten and were dying, they looked up at the serpent on the pole and as they looked, with the eyes of faith, believing God's promise to save them, when they looked in faith, they lived. This is the story that Jesus brings up to Nicodemus. And here's what I really wanna emphasize here. Jesus, he identifies himself with the bronze serpent. Did you guys see this now in verse 14? Check it out. And he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent, in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And so right here, right now, you know, my my heart just wants to explode. Here's why, because this is so important and I so want people to get this. And I'm so right now asking the Holy Spirit, Lord, would you please just give illumination to people so they can see what in the world Jesus was communicating to Nicodemus here. And so what's going on? You may ask yourself, why would Jesus identify himself with a bronze serpent on a pole? If you're listening now, say amen here. Here's why he did it. Because bronze refers to judgment, and the serpent refers to our sin, and the pole refers to the cross. That's what Jesus is saying here, and that leads you to your last point. In identifying himself with the bronze serpent on the pole, Jesus prophesied his death on the cross where he would be judged for our sin and in our place. Does it make sense to you guys? 
So I have some bad news for you this afternoon. Here's the bad news. The wages of sin is death. It's bad news, right? The wages of sin is death. Want some more bad news? Just wanna make you feel, feel good today. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What does that mean? That means humanity is in a heap of trouble. You ready for some good news? Here's the good news. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? This is the good news. This is the hope of our salvation. In the beginning was the Word, the Lagos, that's the eternal Son of God. And the Word was with God, the Word was God. Verse 14, and the Word became flesh. God left heaven on a rescue mission. If we could be saved by being good people, doing good works to earn our way to heaven. Listen, do you really think he would have come? No. He came because he knew that you and I were damned without him. This is serious. And so the word became flesh and dwelt among us. What does that mean? That means that the eternal son of God, he entered time and space. And what did he do? He wrapped himself in human flesh. In other words, he added a human nature to his already eternally existing divine nature. God became man, and what did he do? He's born of a virgin, and he lives this perfect, sinless life, and then he goes to a cross. More good news, Romans 5, 8. God showed his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Paul said, he made him, that means the Father made the Son, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Peter said, he himself bore our sin in his body on the tree. And so the truth is this, Jesus didn't become a sinner, but Jesus was treated as a sinner by the Father as he took our judgment on the cross. Did you know that Jesus Christ was cursed for us? Here's your last verse. I really want the enormity the significance of the gospel to bear down on you today. Look at at what Jesus did. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus, good news, the blessing of Abraham might come to the who? Woo, thank you, Lord. So that we might receive the promise of the Spirit New birth, born again, through faith plus works. Is that what it says? So that, it's all over the New Testament. So that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through, shout the last word, faith. And so Jesus Christ knew that we are under a curse. Why? Because we broke God's law. He knew that. He knew that we all deserve the death penalty because we had broken God's law. We had sinned against God. And what's what's that mean? That means physical death, right? So you die, you take your last breath, they bury you or cremate your body, whatever you wanna do, right? But that's physical death. But you need to know we're not just physical beings. We also have an immortal soul. So it's also the wages of sin is death includes spiritual death which is eternal, not annihilation, it's eternal separation from God. So Jesus knew we're all under the death penalty, but because Christ loves us so much, he said, I'll bear their sin in my body on the cross. I'll become cursed for them. And ladies and gentlemen, the spotless lamb of God, the perfect, holy, sinless son, What did he do? He bore our sin, our sin symbolized by the serpent on the pole. And he received the curse that we deserved by hanging on the tree. And he paid for your sin and my sin in full. And he died 
And then three days later, he rose from the grave and marched out of the tomb and he's victorious over sin, death, and hell. I just, I love preaching the gospel because I love making a lot of Jesus because he deserves our worship and our praise. And so in conclusion, I'm gonna go slow, but I want you to stay with me here because I know, again, in a church this size, a room this size, number of people who are watching, there, there's some people they don't have a relationship with Jesus. And so hear this. If you will turn to Jesus in repentance and faith. Okay, so what is repentance? The word repentance, metanoia, it means a change of mind. Okay, so I'm just gonna go slow here. I want you to stay with me because this is important. You understand the gospel. You need to change your mind about your sin. In other words, my sin is wrong. My sin offends God. The penalty for my sin is death. I need to be forgiven of my sin. And so, it's a change of mind about our sin. And if you will turn to Jesus Christ, now everybody look at me, see see, here's the thing. When you're going your own way, doing your own thing, and you hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and you turn to Jesus, what are you doing at the same time you're turning to Jesus? You're turning from your sin. And so if you'll turn to Jesus Christ, change of mind, you change your mind about your sin, you change your mind about yourself, you realize, I can't save myself. There's no good work I can do, I'm helpless. And you change your mind about the Savior. He's not just a religious leader or a good teacher, he's fully God and fully man. And you turn to Jesus, he's there on that cross, and you believe that he died in my place, he paid for my sins in full. Thank you, Jesus. And then he rose from the grave, victorious over sin and death. And if you will receive Jesus Christ, the risen Christ, as your personal Savior and Lord, please notice I emphasize personal. Savior and Lord, trusting in his promise to save you, you will be born of the Spirit. How can you be so sure Because as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now Nicodemus didn't understand what it meant for the Son of Man to be lifted up, but about two and a half or three years from where we are in the Bible, he'll get it when he sees Jesus lifted up on the cross. And boom. Nicodemus remembered the conversation, and we have really good reason, ladies and gentlemen, to believe that Nicodemus got born again. And those of us who are born again will one day see Nicodemus in the kingdom of God, and we'll get to hang out with him and ask him questions about this conversation after we've spent about 100 years on our face before Jesus. Is anybody looking forward to that day? I am. And so the way that I'm gonna end the message today is ask the elders and elders' wives, ministry team, uh, to come forward. And in a moment, I'm gonna join them on the ground because I just believe that, again, with this many people, there's some people and you're just not sure if you're born again. And so, after Mariel closes in prayer, come, come talk to us. Listen, if you're not ready, we're not pushing anything on anybody. But here's our encouragement. Our encouragement to you is to come talk to us, ask questions, we'll try to answer any of your, any of your questions. But our encouragement to you is turn to Christ in repentance and faith. 
Repentance and faith. If a coin is called conversion, it's got two sides, repentance and faith, you can't have one without the other. And so we're gonna encourage you uh, along those lines. Um, those of you who are watching, um, we encourage you to go to our website, click on I'm new here, and click on Knowing Christ, the gospel is there. We encourage you uh, to do the same. And so I so, so wanna make sure that you feel comfortable after the closing prayer to come and talk to us. Now, maybe you're saved, you know you're saved, praise the Lord, but you have something going on in your life and it's difficult and you need prayer. That's what this ministry team is here for as well. In fact, I think it's very appropriate right now, can we thank them every single weekend? They're here ministering and encouraging and praying. And so if you need prayer, we encourage you to take advantage of that as well. So as I say every week, because I mean it, I love you guys, so happy that I can be your pastor, and Marielle, come on out and finish us up. Wow, church, oh, the gospel is amazing, isn't it? Oh, thank the Lord. Um, I love this part of John, I love the interactions between Jesus and Nicodemus. Um, and I just wanna encourage you this morning, there is no greater gift that you could leave your loved ones than the evidence of a life change, that you are born again and that they will see you again in eternity. And that they have that evidence because they saw the branches swaying in your life by the power of the Spirit. And so I just wanna encourage you today that if you have any questions, if you're not sure um, where you stand with Jesus, again, come up, come talk to us. We'd love to answer your questions. And again, if you have any need for prayer, doesn't matter how big or small, God loves all of your prayers and we would love to intercede um, with you today. Uh, we would also love for anyone who is new to fill out your welcome card. We have them behind the seats. We have a gift for you. We'd love to exchange that card for a gift in the lobby. We have people out there who can help you with that. And lastly, we have multiple ways to give here at Calvary PSL. We're so thankful for the partnership of those of you who give regularly. Thank you. Um, you help us do ministry in our community, and we can't thank you enough. Now let's stand for closing prayer. Lord God, thank you for this time. Thank you for your message. Thank you that we got to worship you this morning as a church body. Lord, as we go out today, those of us who uh, are born of the Spirit, God, I pray that you continue to guide us and fill us and lead us and provide opportunities for us to share the gospel with those who desperately need it. And Lord, if there's anyone here today who isn't sure, God, I pray that you continue to woo them and you continue to help us to lead, help to lead them to you, Lord God, that they can experience a life full of joy and full of peace full of assurance that they will get to spend eternity with you. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.